Did you know there's a place only a few hours from Brisbane that's basically paradise? A fever dream where wildflowers grow everywhere, echidnas pretend to be spiky rocks, and time seems to stand still as you wander through the bush. Where mazes swallow your children like a helpful dragon so you don't have to listen to them whinge about bloody fortcraft or mine night or whatever silly nonsense it is that they're into these days. The idea of a place that remains unsodomized by the long dig of human settlement may sound too good to be true, but my friends, I have seen the light and it is glorious. But what is it that makes this place so special? Haven't beauty in the 21st century become mutually exclusive things? Shut the hell up, my sweet child, and come with me on a trip to Stanthorpe. Fuck, I need to stop doing that. Stanthorpe sits on the New England Highway and it's about 16,000 kilometers from Old England. Like a thirsty little bird, it's perched itself on the banks of Quart Pot Creek. This serendipitous stream meanders its way through a nearby valley of the Granite Belt, an offshoot of the Great Dividing Range in southern Queensland. And despite what the creek's name suggests, it's not a great place to buy 7 grams of weed. It was once a great place to mine tin, however, and that's exactly what Europeans decided to do when they arrived here 150 years ago. So important was tin in early Stanthorpe's history that the literal translation of the name Stanthorpe means tin town. Remains of these early mining operations still exist a hop, skip and busted CV joint away from the town. Great for four-wheel drive enthusiasts, but excruciatingly painful for anyone that actually likes their ute. They should only be five kilometres away, but I think it's going to take me about an hour to fucking get there. These ruins are nestled within the Sundown National Park, an isolated section of wilderness about an hour south of Stanthorpe. It's a spectacular area that drives home how isolated these early miners would have been. If it took me two hours to drive a very short distance in this place, it would have taken miners in the 1800s days of walking before they could even dream of seeing a woman. If you leave 20 men alone in the bush in a place like this, things are bound to get really weird. But sex, oh sorry, but sex wasn't the only thing tin miners had to worry about. As the prices of tin lurched to and fro over the years, people decided that basing their livelihoods around literally the worst metal wasn't all it had cracked up to be. At the turn of the last century, the local Catholic priest, who may or may not have been blind, stood atop a fence and addressed what he thought was a crowd of people, and proclaimed, from now on we shall grow grapes so that we may make altar wine. But his poor vision hid the fact that the crowd of people was actually a crowd of cows. Is he talking to us? One cow asked. I've got no idea, another replied. I'm just a cow, I don't speak English. And so spurred on by the promises of unlimited wine and the murmurs of the local bovines, people started farming grapes en masse, as well as other things like apples, horses and dinosaurs. Ha! Even when the wine turned out to just be normal wine, the townsfolk still persisted. Being almost 800 metres above sea level, the climate here is classed as subtropical highland, perfect for growing a wide variety of cold weather crops. It's an area that's generally pleasant in the summer and very brisk in the winter, with the odd smattering of snow every two or three years. Look at this, 10 to 7 in the morning in Stanthorpe, and it's bloody snowing like crazy. Indeed, Stanthorpe prides itself on being the coldest town in Queensland, which realistically is not that much of a distinction, given that the majority of Queensland is usually on fire for most of the year. Not old Stanthorpe though, a 40 degree day has never happened here and it probably won't for at least another 5 years. All this red hot coldness makes the area perfect for growing not just fruit but some rather flavourful fungi as well. At the Truffle Discovery Centre slash Law Dogs you'll discover just how expensive mushrooms can get and also how to train your dog to be a lawyer. Truffles are so expensive in fact that I wasn't allowed to film inside the shop, you'll just have to go there yourself. If $20 for truffle seasoning sounds too expensive for you, just remember, chicks dig truffles. You want to know what else chicks dig? Cheese and wine. There's about half a million wineries here, one of which is centred around possibly the most ridiculous building I've ever seen in my life. This enormous, stone-clad, hideously charming erection is Castle Glen. So named because it's a castle that was probably built by some bloke named Glen or something, I don't know. It's a site that you don't often see in Australia, a quasi-classical construction that would serve well as a highwayside motel for a travelling salesman and his stinky, cigarette-stained prostitute. Fortunately for this building, however, its location lends it a certain kitschy charm and it complements the surrounding vineyard very well. If it had a moat filled with wine, I'd gladly save a fair maiden from its ivory tower. How old was this building? I built it last century. Did you? Yeah. One year, really? Is that it? Wow. So I was younger then. <laughs> but Castle Glen ain't the only landmark in the area that's faking it. Down the road, some farmer decided to build a pyramid out of the used granite he had left on his farm, and now there's just a big pyramid with a tattered Australian flag proudly blowing in the wind in the middle of a field in buttfuck nowhere. A large sign on the gate has been erected telling people to get the hell off this farmer's property, but you can't tell my white ass what to do. I'll diddle any bloody landmark I want to. 
or at the very least, I'll give it a red hot go. This stiff columnar erection stands tall over Stanthorpe, a monument with the unfortunate distinction of being the most uncomfortable rectal thermometer in the world. It watches over the park that lines the banks of Court Pot Creek, an ever-present reminder that on any given winter's night you could gain the ability to cut glass with your nipples. Just up the creek is the Red Bridge, which despite not being red is still definitely a bridge. This big old lump of rivets and bolts was built in 1886 and carried the Southern Railway line all the way down to the border. While the last freight train rolled down these tracks back in 2007, the big bridge that's not red but is a bridge stands tall against the elements, a reminder of times past when your only travel options were by train or horse and the venerable Fort Falcon had not yet been invented. Every now and then a tourist railway operates a train along here, but that day was not today and this train is not that train. Unfortunately for this train, it's in Scotland. A short trundle south on a train similar to the train in Scotland that's not here would have had you arrive in Wollongarra. This town sprang up on the border of Queensland and New South Wales due to the necessity of a break of gauge between the two states' railway systems. You see, Australia was founded as separate colonies and not one big state, and back in the 1800s the various colonial governments didn't care much for cooperation. One of the results of this was each colony having a different railway gauge, with Queensland's being 400mm narrower than New South Wales. Given that this railway line was the first link between Sydney and Brisbane, Wollongarra had an important role to play until around the 1930s when a more direct standard gauge line was built. After that, traffic dwindled and Wollongarra was slowly forgotten about, yet another relic lost to the annals of time. Ah shit, that says annals. Just because the region doesn't boast regular trains doesn't mean that there's nothing to see here though. If you hate your children, you can send them off to get lost in the Granite Belt Maze, a place that I thought as a big brained adult I'd easily be able to conquer. Fuck, I hate riddles. Lift hinge to find the dead end number. Unscramble your letters to make the answer. This answer has numbers also. After wandering around a maze that apparently wasn't THE maze, confused, befuddled and trying to figure out how this puzzle worked, I finally made it to the actual maze to begin my quest. It was time to find out if I truly am smarter than a 5th grader. Snop. What? I don't get it. Letter 10, you need letter... Oh, okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. My height allowed me to cheat a bit and see over the top of the maze, but after initially finding the clues I needed in quick succession, I started running into dead ends. The last number I needed to find was 6, but I couldn't see it anywhere. Every now and then I'd pass an old lady who'd tell me the number was in the other direction, and every time it felt like she was lying to me. Eventually, I got bored of suffering pranks at the wrinkly hands of the elderly and decided to cut my losses. I'm famous because of my role in movies. I'm never the lead character, just a solid object. What am I? Gunman's not a word. Gunman. Nug. Man. Mag. Magnum 44. Was it 44 Magnum? Yes. Yes. Cool. Sweet. <laughs> if you're feeling dejected after learning that your IQ is just barely higher than room temperature, you can head to Jirawinas National Park where you can at least assert your physical superiority. Wandering through here, you can see why they call it the Granite Belt. Huge boulders obnoxiously perch themselves all over the place as well as on top of each other, which must be how they make babies. In addition to these stupendous sections of stone, there's also a ton of wildlife here. So much so that the park rangers have decided to employ local animals. Here, a wallaby mows the grass of the day use area, while this echidna is digging holes for the local lumps of granite to lay their eggs, which I'm pretty sure is how that works. If you're anything like me, you're probably a bit of an idiot, and I'm sorry about that. But camping also probably gets you rock fucking hard, and boy can I tell you, Stan Thorpe delivers. I could write paragraphs upon paragraphs about the beauty of camping here, but some words are better left unspoken. I had me a woman down in Tennessee. Oh, she used to love me. Free fever got me and I had to go. I never seen the woman no more. New York City is a place I've been. I was there one time with a traveling band. Young girl there wanted me to stay. I think she wanted me to pay. Rolled it out. Rolled it in, here we go, down the road again Drifter's life is a drifter's wife Don't say I didn't tell you so
sixty acres full of sunshine and a hundred and sixty million stars above. Most areas of inland Queensland are pretty formidably dry places and while beautiful in their own unique way, also often suck to visit, especially if you're a dead cow. But not good old Stano. Its unassuming presence exudes a level of beauty that not many other regions can muster. It's got everything a nature lover could want. It's quiet, relaxed, full of wildlife, and I only spotted a few teenagers with mullets, so the odds of having your property stolen here seem to be pretty slim. So what's my advice after all this then? Well, if big boulders don't beguile your bulge, if smelly cheese makes you wheeze, if old train lines send shivers down your spine, I have four words for you, my friend. Don't go to Stanthorpe. And now, a haiku. A red bridge, silent. Softly flowing over quartz rocks. A small creek, no pot. <laughs>